In the 3D bio printing rooms, we like to keep everything sterile. When you're using cells, you don't want to contaminate anything. So gloves and then your lab coat. And so it's basically you're just printing body parts? Is that what's going on? Right. You want to do the honors? Sure. So I'm about to 3D print a human ear. The Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine is developing methods to manufacture human tissue, using specialized 3D printers to fabricate a range of functioning, viable body parts. So here we are 3D printing skin. Uh -huh. um, so the aim of this is basically to uh, make printers where you could print sheets and sheets of it and then basically be able to transplant it on a patient who needs it. Wow. We have a couple demos set up here. The first one here is a, an artificial heart valve, and it's forcing fluid back and forth, and that is an artificial blood vessel. It's actually meant to be a carotid artery, like in the neck. And so then the idea is you can take out the part that isn't working and then put this in. How different is this from like 3D so printing a trinket? Like the, the exact same concept. You take um, a 3D CAD file, and then you convert that into your printing code and then you can print it. The only difference here is that we've got all the biomaterials and your cellular components, too. And where do, where do the cells come from? Depending on the patient, you can take a postage-sized stamp of cells and then turn it into all the different cell types of the body. And then how do you implant it? You just sew it on? Exactly. It. Suture it on and <laughs> cover it up and you're good to go. Amazing. Well, one of the major challenges in medicine, of course, is not having a sufficient number of tissues and organs that you can use to re replace in patients. And so the concept here is why not just create them? How long do you think it is until you can print a whole body? Well, I remember watching the very first uh, Westworld movie. You know, mm -hmm. it came out in the movie theaters many years ago. Sure. Uh, is that possible in the future? You never know. Science has few boundaries. In 2009, the patent behind the key method of 3D printing expired. And as more followed, so did a new revolution in desktop 3D printing. Printers got smaller and cheaper, allowing anyone to print models, parts, and tools on demand. And nerdy hobbyists turned their printing passions into a multi-billion dollar industry. So we're at the worldwide headquarters of Form Labs, one of the biggest 3D printing manufacturers in the world. And like any respectable startup, they've got a ping pong table. <laughs> and this is Max, he's the founder and CEO. <laughs> the first 3D printing uh, technologies were invented in the early 80s, but it was still really inaccessible to most people who could benefit from it because the machines were so expensive and also really difficult to use. And they didn't necessarily see the potential for a 3D printer that would be a lot lower cost and would be more like, say, an office 2D printer. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. Ooh, it's in the goo. There was a lot of excitement at the beginning of this kind of desktop 3D printing wave that 3D printers will be in all of our homes. But it's proven to be a lot further off than everyone hoped for. Cool. So if there was sort of a 3D printing hype cycle, now that we're kind of past it, what does the future look like? 3D printing is used in pretty much every product development process. What's coming soon with 3D printing is going into production, and so it has the potential to take years of product development and moving into manufacturing and turn that into weeks even. Wow, that's, so that's huge. That's huge. We're in Boston going to a company called Desktop Metal that has innovated 3D printing metal for mass production. It's a lot of printers. So yeah, so this is our print farm. We are now inside of it. And what you see is the, the printer in action. And they're printing parts like you see here on the table. You know, and the geometry can be you know, very simple, like a, uh, like a gear. Right. right? And uh, it can get very complicated, like this, which is a uh, pneumatic distribution housing. Wow, looks kind of steampunk. In 3D printing, the first 20 years was used for prototyping. And now we're going into a new phase of 3D printing where we, we go from prototyping into mass production. And that has huge implications. So whereas before you had a factory that make one engine component in the US and then another component overseas, and then they ship the stuff around, that set up the whole trade system that we've basically architected the world around. Now you can print parts anywhere as you need them to produce a product. So we're right at the beginning of, of a revolution. 
Yeah, this is, a, this is a fourth industrial revolution in the making. In addition to fundamentally altering worldwide economic supply chains, now mass-produced 3D printed metal might also upend the way parts are designed from the ground up. Tools are fairly difficult to use to create very, very complex shapes. But with additive manufacturing of metal, we can create crazy shapes. So what we're doing is we're sort of subjecting these parts to this washing machine effect of dynamic transitional forces. So what we have is the ability to very quickly create shapes that are very strong and lightweight, where basically the cell mass is distributed only where it's needed. So like because of machine learning, manufactured goods or industrial design will likely mimic biological design? Absolutely. It's not like you tell a computer, make it by or spire shape. It's that you tell a computer, give me the most efficient shape, and the shape that you're getting looks bio. While desktop metal is spearheading this new global industrial revolution, researchers at MIT are thinking outside the printer entirely. We visited two labs pushing the limits of material science and challenging the way we think of materials themselves. Essentially, printing is a material science chamber. Like, it got us more and more focused, understanding like, what can materials do, how far can we push our products to behave in new ways. This is a, a cellulose-based material. You'll see that it'll morph you know, just with the moisture of my skin. Mm -hmm. So same thing, but it only transforms by sunlight. You can apply it to windows, like glass facades or skylights. The last category of research that we study is self-assembly. They'll come together slowly over time. They'll make these kind of cubic lattice structures. What we're interested in in this scenario is like, what's the far futures of fabrication? Like, can we give more and more agency where the materials can make decisions, learn, adapt, perform in ways we've never even imagined? Whether aided by self-assembly or artificial intelligence, turning digital processes into tangible objects is a key factor in how we envision the future of fabrication. How would you characterize the work that you do at the Center for Bits and Atoms? We try to understand how digital things become physical things and physical things become digital things. Now, interestingly, the founders of computer science, von Neumann and Turing, the last thing in their life they studied is exactly this question about how computation becomes physical how to design a machine that communicates a computation for its own construction. The core research project here is now to actually make that. You can think of it as, as the Star Trek replicator, because that's really what this is. This is the future that you're envisioning? Is that oh, what you're it's the about? future that's on the table in front of us. Oh, hello. So these are what we call relative robots, and relative robots are designed to operate specifically within this lattice environment. But what we're working on now is we have robots that can crawl on the structure. The next step is to give bolting end effectors to them so that they can build the structure and have an army of these things building a big structure oh, in space. Oh, I see what you're saying. When you have armies of these robots building high-performance structures for you, possibilities are going to be endless. It's going to help us get to Mars, it's going to help us get to other galaxies, it's going to help us explore the universe. I'm in. It might sound far-fetched, but all the technologies we've seen are converging in pursuit of a civilization on Mars. And NASA's manufacturing wing is revolutionizing how we'll use 3D printing to get there. So this is a laboratory training complex. It's um, pretty much a one-to-one -one, uh, mock-up of the U.S. lab on um, Space Station right now. This is actually our backup for the first 3D printer uh, that we ever launched in space. Mm -hmm. The Space Station is an amazing vehicle. We're still somewhat Earth-dependent with our Space Station model. For Mars, we want to be Earth-independent. Space does really drive home how important it is to conserve. You know, what are we really going to need for in-space manufacturing to, to make these parts? What you really have to do is have sustainability. This is the refabricator. So it's the first ever integrated 3D printer and recycler all in one. We want to be able to, in one machine, 3D print the part, and then when you're done with it, you just feed it back in and it creates new filament and you can make a whole new part. What excites me the most is that closed loop life cycle. It may seem like a long time before we're going to Mars, it's really not, and we have to work on these technologies today to be ready. Is the 3D printer going to help us get to Mars? Absolutely, 1,000%. Back on Earth, a startup in Los Angeles is reimagining how we could rapidly automate the production of orbital rockets. So that's a 3D printer? Yes, this is uh, Stargate, which we developed and built ourselves, and it's the largest metal 3D printer in the world. 
Why did you call it Stargate? There's a video game called StarCraft, uh -huh. and Stargate <laughs> is what you build to warp in spaceships. And so we named it after that because we're warping in spaceships. This thing is massive. Fundamentally, what we're doing is feeding in uh, aluminum wire okay. and then melting it with a very high power 11 kilowatt laser. So it's like a big soldering arm. Like uh, a, like with a like... laser. Yeah, <laughs> with a laser. This is the first large part that we made, which was a fuel tank. Normally, getting a tank of this size um, in like aerospace or rocket quality um, would take you well over 12 months. How long did it take you to make this? Uh, it's like seven days of print time, actually. Seven days. Now that it's developed, yeah, seven days, yeah. If you think about 10 years from now, if your company starts making more and more rockets, what does that mean? Well, our long-term mission was we want to be the first company to 3D print a rocket on Mars. So you're 3D printing rockets to send a 3D printer to Mars to 3D print more rockets? To come back to Earth, yeah. <laughs> yeah. With limited time to do something in your life, like why not just do something very ambitious? The idea is it could inspire other people to go after their dreams, much like I was inspired... By StarCraft. By StarCraft, <laughs> yeah, yeah, by StarCraft. Since the beginning of time, the act of making something using tools is one of the most defining traits of humans. When people look back on the fourth industrial revolution, what was the enabling technology? It's going to be manufacturing, and it's going to be manufacturing with total freedom. You know, it's interesting, right? Because science fiction really does predict many times real science. In a way, that's what you're seeing right now coming full circle. Science fiction becoming science fact.